everyone. Welcome once again to the Adventures Travel Club television show. Betty, this is quite a view, isn't it? Yeah. I always keep saying it looks like a picture postcard because well, it, it does it to it me. Does, yeah. Well, this is what they make picture postcards of, you know, or, or scenes like this. No kidding. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, what I'm saying, it doesn't look like you did it. It looks like you might have just t faked it or something. Oh, no, no, but no, I no, know no. you didn't. Yeah, no, there, we were there. We took the pictures. And th well, I think what is so interesting here, of course, what we're talking about is the city of Stockholm in Sweden. And... Um, the uh, we we drove up on top of this hill so that we could get a really nice view from uh, this area where we are, and we're we're in a actually where we're located we're we're in a, an older section, uh, but it is not the the old town. The old town would be way off over to our left. However, uh, in in that area there, which you're kind of looking at, and then to the left of that, and we're looking over some of the Baltic here. There is a which surprised me in the in the city as we. Uh, traveled from little island to island uh, that on one side of the bridge would be the lake and then on the other side would be the uh, the Baltic Sea and actually there's there's some locks there that keep uh, keep that divided and so you're looking at the the Baltic part right now how still the water is mm-hmm very very nice very nice indeed so this is a uh, this again is a couple of shots here that I wanted to get of the of the skyline there and uh, I, I was very impressed. I was really impressed with the city. I thought it was a just a very, very beautiful, uh, very beautiful city. And like so many other cities that we see now, of course, in Europe, you have what we call the walking street. And uh, Stockholm certainly had a, a a big one. That's where you're going to find all the tourists and all the shops with Alice. all the good things in it. You know. <laughs> but let's find out a little bit more about this area from our guide. The Mountain Street here, Fjällgatan, has got a cultural stamp on it as well. Here you will not find any private proprietors. The city owns most of the houses. And the small staircase to the left, the staircase of the last penny, going up to one of our old execution spots. So down here, the ones to be executed in those days could have the last drink. There's a house being restored, and since they have a cultural stamp on it up here, they always have to try to get it in as original shape as possible. As you can see, you just walk around the bay, it's a walk of 15 minutes, and you're right in the heart of the old town. And then we move over the locks again, Slussen, and uh, we need the locks here. It is called the Lock of Karl Johan, after our first Bernadotte King, Charles the 14th, you are. And why we need the locks? Well, the Lake Mirland here on your left hand side is nearly one meter higher than the Baltic to the right. And uh, to go from one waterway to another is nearly impossible due to the currents that appear. The lock here, which is at the foot of the uh, statue, here we can only help small pleasure boats passing through. Bigger boats need to go past a city south of Stockholm, which is called Södertälje. We're moving up on the bridge of the ships, and here to the left then, the eldest restaurant of Stockholm, Zum Franciscana. We've had it since 1421 here. And the bridge of the ship, as we go up in the old town you'll see these houses are rather big and the idea was that the people and the boats who came over the Baltic to the right here to us would get a nice and rich impression of Stockholm. In reality it was rather dirty in the old town in those days but the seamen did not notice that. They first unloaded and then they went up in the alleys and saw what it really was like here, imperial family. And then in the bay as well, the Grand Hotel here to the right, and that is the hotel where the Nobel Prize winners live during their stay here in Stockholm. 
Well, you think, Betty, that that's a pretty ritzy hotel? Oh, it looks like it. You know, I love the old towns. These are my favorite places to go in all the countries we go to. And here we are, right in the middle of it. No, but it's, no, it's good to know. Well, like you say, Betty, you like the old town, and now so here we are, right in the right in the center of it. And of course, around the square that we're going to be going to uh, were some of the original uh, homes of some of the very wealthy people oh, yeah. in the early days. And uh, th this is really nice. Of course, it's all cobblestone streets here, yeah. and the palace is up here. And uh, if you hit it at the right time, of course, you can see the uh, changing of the guard. I think you know it, it seems like most any uh, place that still has a monarchy still always does that ceremony, the changing of the guard. We saw it in, in, in England, and it was yep. quite impressive. In England and also in Norway. and uh, uh, This is, excuse me, mm -hmm. you know this was the one place where we saw more people. Well, yeah, because this is <laughs> where all the back, huh? this is where all the souvenirs were sold. Oh, <laughs> because it's been such it was always amazing to me the few people that were around. It was well, you have to remember too, though, that this was also holiday time for the Scandinavians. Yeah. So a lot of them were probably down near the Mediterranean, you know, soaking up the sun and uh, enjoying themselves down there. So that that's the thing with Europe, you know, during certain months uh mm, well, well you will find some places that will be a little well bit deserted. Know, not everywhere August but some places. is the time for them to, for anybody in europe to yeah. leave right so anyway here we are now on the uh on this main square in an old town and we're going to join our guard here our guide i should say excuse me a guard yeah okay. and she's <laughs> going to explain a bit more about it as said as we started holme means small islands and it's only the main body of the palace, not even the two wings. The church and half of this that is on firm ground. And you can see it, look there. Goes up and down in the pavement. The rest of the houses here have been built upon wooden piles, just like Venice. The king very often gave out a part of the beach and a water property and told the people, fill it out, build your house any way you want to. So one did as in uh, Venice. We now have a problem since the land is rising on the side of the Lake Melaren. I'm stupid. On the side of the Baltic Sea, because that's the one we have on that side. <laughs> uh, and this means that the, you know, the houses are so to say, lifting itself out of the waters. The wooden pile come in contact with the air and start to rot away, thereby, as in Venice, gliding towards the water. This is not acceptable. The whole old town has a cultural stamp on it. When something is restored, rebuilt here, it is always done in such a matter that it goes back in its original shape as much as possible. Uh, in the end, it's not just this island, you know, also the island we were on, the island of the nobility and the island of the Holy Spirit have the same problem. We might have to build a dam and in that way we would keep the water level of the lake and then all of these piles would be underwater and then we would have no problem with it. Now this red house that we see right here was built by some very, very wealthy people and it, in its day that probably was the fanciest house that was uh, right here on the square. But along came the Joneses and they built this other house right here which was a little bit bigger and a little more ostentatious, keeping up with the, the Jones. Jones. And on the first floor, the Swedish Academy, they are the ones to decide to whom the Nobel Prize in Literature will be handed out and that is normally done somewhere around October. The gentlemen and ladies have to get over the shock of it, prepare themselves to go to the cold Sweden, and uh, there is, you know, lot, lot around them. But you belong to the countries who've had the opportunity of receiving very many Nobel Prizes over the years. The well here, that, or uh, the fountain, not much of water did they have here. The uh, defense wall, the eldest one, is very close to here. We'll go down to the pre-street. And people in the old days, they did of course not dare to go out 
outside the defense walls to wash. You never know, knew if you were to be attacked. There was a house of the Holy Spirit on that island, and next to it was a possibility to go and have a bath, uh, you know, like a public bathhouse. The problem being that was also used not in so morally high <laughs> ways of using it, both money-wise and otherwise, so the better families did not go there. So it was rather dirty. Thing. Why on earth do you have a runestone here? Because I can't answer that. I don't know. And as you can see, it's not a complete runestone. It is from the beginning of the Viking period, and as always, if you know it, you will understand why. I will walk a bit up to it very shortly. You see it on this. The mouth of the snake is closed. And we are in the beginning of the Viking period. When we come to the um, part where Christianity begins here in Sweden, you often get the snake opening the mouth, attacking something invisible, or the double tongue comes out, and you cannot very well see it, say it more symbolically, what the two choices they had. And then we have famous rune stones starting like this, ending in a cross. Then you know that that's a family that has accepted Christianity. And here, the missionaries in some places were rather smart. Because we have graves, uh, we had graves up to the 14th century in Sigtun, our late capital, where you had a Viking buried and next to it a Christian one. Which meant they did not all throw all the Viking culture over end, and that made it a bit more easy for people to accept this new religion. The, uh, it took a long time though, because we have also graves in other parts of Sweden from the 14th century where people are buried in a Christian way, but you get the feeling, you know, if it doesn't work there, I'll try on the other side. They also had Viking symbols with them. The rune stones here, 26 letters as a total, used up to the last century. And here again we have this long country. If you would put a needle in the south of Sweden and turn it all around, we will land in Egypt, just to give you an idea. And not so many people living here, farmers mostly, wives, husband, children out taking care of, um, you know, animals or so. It's not too easy to put some paper on a tree and hope somebody will read it, but to carve in the runes to say where you were and where you were heading was a very good way of communicating and that's why was, it was still used. And still in the Swedish schools, I must think, take some time, I think it is two years ago now, sixth class, that my children learned the rune alphabet. So they can, I have also learned it, but I have forgotten it, but if you have the alphabet, you, we know exactly which letter goes with what. It is, we are able to decipher it. The um, Vikings, what I disapprove most of with the Vikings is that you show them as brutes. But we are helping there as well. You know, the most stupid thing I can think of is these helmets with horns on them. <laughs> they did not. In those days though, when you killed an animal, you took care of everything. So they carved out the horn, they, they cooked them, and then they used it to drink out of. But they did not put their glass on the helmet and off they went. But of course, this with the horn, the helmets with the horn gives them a much more aggressive outlook, and that was in the image of what we wanted to spread and what others wanted to hear. Uh, Russia has officially now said Kiev is a city founded by Vikings. And we think that the word Russia, Rush, comes from the Swedish word Rus, which were the horses that the Vikings had with them on their ships. And as they went to Miklagod, uh, to our meatballs, the Swedish ones, 
The Turks have the much smaller, much spicier in a white sauce. And the Turkish dolmies are our uh, cabbage dolmies we eat up here. So they did, as anybody who travels, you find something interesting, you go home and talk about it, and then you adapt it to whatever is to be found in the country you live. And in America, finally, it took time for us, but you have also acknowledged that Leif Erikson was the first one to get over there, and not Columbus, who was somewhat later, even though that is more well known. And I think, um, this is a personal opinion, I think the Vikings were successful due to the fact that they were taller than other people in Europe at that time. And if you were short, ones and the come people up to two meters and in the beginning textile was not known to them they had you know from the animals the um, furs on made them look even bigger I would also have put my legs on my back and ran in the other <laughs> direction they were neither more brutal nor better than anybody else in the world of God of the Vikings you can draw precise parallels to the Greek and Roman gods and they are by some looked upon as being more classy. Even though I think they were rather brutal as well. <laughs> Their world of gods. This is then the pre street, as I said, up at the Great Square following, and you can see it, it goes in a demicircle. The eldest defense wall around Stockholm. And you can also see that the merchants who lived here were not that wealthy in the old houses, like the ones up there. Normally, as it was in the Middle Ages, you had your shop on the ground floor, you lived then in one, two or three floors, depending on how much money you had. And you see what looks like small towers on the top? That was the warehouse. And that's why you had this metal thing sticking up, because there were ropes. So you hoisted the things down in the morning that you wanted to sell, and then you had it up again. I think it's very interesting what she had to say about the Vikings, you know, that uh, they were. They were taller people, and uh, if they were wearing, you know, furs, uh, animal furs, and, you <laughs> yeah. know, going into these other, these other areas, they probably did look a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, threatening, and, and especially, <coughs> you know, with the different hair. They, were, if they, if they, were, they had the blonde hair, and then they were going down into the Mediterranean countries and, and things like that, where the people at that time were probably a little bit shorter. They would be a they would be a little fearsome yes, like looking, I would run they? the other way just like she <laughs> said <laughs> <laughs> I think I would too but this area is so uh, so interesting and uh, that rune stone that was uh, uh, there I guess that is an original one that was uh, that was put there I, b I believe anyway but I didn't realize that there was a, a, a whole language with that and the and that they were still teaching that yes. in the Swedish schools but you know that's very good that's very nice that the, they're keeping that uh, uh, keeping that tradition alive and so that you know just won't pass on into into history and no one know anything about it uh, or lose the knowledge I should say there and there's a little shop there you can see how uh, where you could probably uh, pick Souvenirs. up some pictures of that yeah <laughs> but let's go now inside the church shall we and it is a Catholic church you can see it you still have here where the doors were out to the monasteries and the gardens in previous years but Reformation started here in the beginning of the 16th century. Reformation in Sweden, having well, unfortunately not much to do with religion, meant chiefly a question of finances. Because Gustavus Vasa had borrowed lots of money from the people of Lübeck to pay for the guerrilla warfare, in modern terms you would call it, we had against the Danes to get rid of those here. And when Gustav Vasa came on the throne, of course, the people of Lübeck wanted their money back. But there wasn't any among the people, but the church had. So he closed all the monasteries, he took all the precious items out, even the church bells were taken down, melted down, and we could pay, and he became the richest man in Sweden in his days at the same time. And since then we have had a state church, it's actually first, the last years we have new monasteries, Catholic ones, which means that 85% nearly of the Swedes are Protestants, Lutherans. But you can see that we probably did not behave all too well in the beginning at the Reformation, otherwise that painting would never have been done. 
The painting is painted in 1535, and it was this phenomena in the sky that people could not explain to themselves. So it uh, was said that it was a sign of God for the Stockholmers to behave better. In other words, follow the Lutheran religion. If you also look up there, you see it's double glazing. The church is definitely from the inside a Gothic church. But as we approached, and from the mountain street, you saw a Baroque tower. And the reason was that when the new palace was built, one wanted the church to harmonize better, and therefore gave her a new covering. You, in the last century, in our churches throughout Sweden, one often put up the white, the virgin white color on the wall, which is a bit of a pity, because in previous years, the churches were very richly decorated. We have managed to get out four vaults here where more or less the original decoration is to be found, but not quite, and then one from the 17th century, but that is it. We will, as you walk around here, you see it walk on graves wherever you walk. There are over 2,000 buried under the floors here, so wherever you put your feet, you're probably trampling on somebody, but they have become earth nowadays, so no problem. And here, not so many nobility, well, the poorer nobility, since they had their own church, you saw, and then lots of rich German merchant families. I think it was interesting to note, as she mentioned here about the, the German merchants uh, that were buried there, and of course we saw that over in, in uh, Norway as well, in Bergen especially, the whole area there uh, where the German merchants had come in and had, uh, had built up you know, quite a little uh, civilization and uh, area of trade there. But anyway, here in the church is really quite beautiful, and there's a, there's a very important statue over here. And I thought at first, well, oh, this must be St. George fighting the dragon. Wrong, but we're going to find out a little bit more about that. She's going to explain this to us, and uh, I'm sorry it's so dark in here because you can't really get the, the greatest pictures in the world, but uh, if we listen to her explanation, I think it will... Uh, paint the picture for us as it were and so here he is this is not St. George and the dragon really isn't the dragon that St. George fought. So what you're seeing is actually not St. John that is our king Stan Stubre fighting the dragon the only thing not out of wood here is on the dragon you see elk horns instead fighting the dragons, which is then of course Denmark. And if you look at the foot of the dragon, it is also a way to humiliate them. You see that a head is lying, a leg is lying, and at the, end the way, at the end of the dragon you have an arm that has been chopped off from somebody. Just to show the Danes how badly beaten they were by us. And then in the lower part, one scenes from this wall. And the Virgin Mary Mother is therefore, of course, not she. It is Mother Sweden coming to, nearly having to sacrifice her lamb, Sweden, to the Danes. But then not having to in the end. And up to the 30s, we had a relic up of the king up in his helmet. We put this in, and also the silver Bible, a Bible that you find in Uppsala, written by the first Christian community in Europe at all in the 25 first years of the 6th century. Uh, and this, these two are therefore the most precious things we have. Is most of course resemblant to the candles you light in a Catholic church, which in Sweden has absolutely nothing to do with it. The first time this came up at all, was also in 1968, Martin Luther King should have come to a Ukraine meeting in Uppsala. He was shot a couple of months in advance, and so there one made a globus, symbolic globus, and from it went out branches and called it the Tree of Reconciliation. Uh, and from there, the tradition of either having a globus like this, or at the side of the sarcophagus, there you see a symbolic branch, you find in nearly all of our churches. But the Swedish church said it would not be in the spirit of Martin Luther King of, um, well, giving money 
in memory to somebody's dead, his philosophy was more to help the living. So the money is then distributed through different aid organizations all over the world for people who need help to survive and not become dead. It was interesting that when we went into uh, other churches uh, there in Sweden, we saw the same a situation as right as you come into the church where you can light the candles and uh, I remember the one in Uppsala uh, was a little more stylistic than this particular globe that they had there and and there was a little sign there in Swedish and also in English that you could you know light a candle and say a prayer for someone that really needed praying for and that was that was very nice but the inside of this church is still I think very ornate even though they may have taken some of the things out after the Reformation but they left a lot of a lot of beautiful things here, don't you think so, oh, Betty? Yeah, I I was thinking about that myself. That even though it was is not Catholic anymore, there are still so many things of Catholicism of the building mm -hmm. of the churches as we've seen throughout the world. I would love to have been there. That organ looked like it was uh, really quite uh, quite a great. Uh, work there. I'd love to have heard the organ play. Oh, oh well, we're going to leave right now, but be careful. Okay. Don't step on anybody on no, your way No, she out, says okay? it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. In another palace. And I said the main body of the palace is on firm ground. And if you look here at the wing, you'll see that the windows are not standing in a particular perfect straight line. And that is the same thing, these wooden piles that we have under most of our houses up here in the old town. Up here now, on your left-hand side, the only garden of the royal palace. And when you see this, you can understand that the royal family, rather when the kids came, wanted to move out from here. Drottning Hall, one wing is built around an inner garden, so they could let the children run around freely, so to speak. The um, Originally, of course, it was meant to be a garden all the way down to the water, but we ran out of money. And the fortress that lay there, that burned 1697, this one was built or opened in 1754. So it did take a very long time to build up this palace. Our king of today, his name is Charles the 16th Gustave married to a commoner, half German, half Brazilian is her origin, Queen Sylvia, and they have three children, Crown Princess Victoria, now 20, uh, Prince Carl Philip, who's 18, and then Princess Madeleine, who is 15. Time for us to say goodbye. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.